So um, welcome all of you to this uh, this um, webinar on shock mobility, where today it's my uh, great pleasure to welcome Professor Biao Zhang uh, and also all uh, the participants in in this webinar. My name is Nina Nyberg Sørensen and I am a DIS employee. I head our migration department um, at the Danish Institute of International Studies in, in Copenhagen. Due to the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, we have chosen to uh, convert some of our migration seminars to webinars and this is uh, one of them. The advantage of that is that uh, we have a much more international crowd that is possible during our physical uh, seminars on, 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 on DIES in Copenhagen. And I have seen in the list of attendees that we have many today. The disadvantage is of course that dialogue and discussion becomes less direct and lively. Let me say a few words about uh, the, format, uh, the format that we will be using. Uh, due to the large number of participants, we cannot uh, have you all on screen. So we will ask you to use the Q&A device at the bottom of the screen, write your comments and, and questions along uh, the way. Today, we have technical assistance from the DEEDS conference department. Uh, Trine Rosenberg, who is head of the unit, will help us uh, run this uh, webinar as, as smooth as, as possible. So hopefully, uh, everything will work fine. When we start, uh, Biao Xiang will talk for around 20 minutes, and he and I will then have a dialogue in, in which we include the questions and comments received from all of you. We have a maximum of one hour and 50 minutes. Uh, if we don't need that time, we might stop earlier, but we will stop um, uh, uh, at a quarter to four uh, whatsoever. So I will wrap up uh, at uh, 20 minutes to four uh, by the latest. Now, so much uh, for practicalities and format, uh, because it is really my great pleasure to introduce uh, Biao Xiang our speaker today, who is Professor in Social Anthropology at the University of Oxford and soon to be the director of um, the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology in Halle. And his work is well known, I'm sure, to many of you and for sure uh, uh, to migration scholars around the world. Uh, his work include various books, um, uh, for instance, Global Body Shopping, an Indian international labor system in the information technology industry uh, from 2006, uh, transcending, uh, transcending Boundaries, um, the story of a migrant um, uh, village in Beijing, and a forthcoming book uh, entitled The Intermediary Trap, International Labor Recruiters and the Chinese State in, Transitions, in Transition that uh, will be published by Princeton University Press. His work, of course, also includes um, several articles of which uh, my own favorites are those who concern the workings of various migration infrastructures that aid uh, human uh, mobility in various forms. Throughout his career, Biao Xiang has worked on various types of migration, internal and international, uh, unskilled and highly skilled, uh, left behind uh, family members and return in China, in India and Australia. And instead of taking migration as a distinct phenomenon to be explained, um, um, uh, Biao Shang sees it as a particular means of social change that reveals larger forces at work. Thus he uses migration as a lens uh, to look at, at the world at large. He is also developing an interest in transnational reproduction. Uh, what does it mean when an increasing number of nations have to rely on foreigners to reproduce themselves uh, demographically and socially? And more people cross borders, borders uh, to nurture life, um, for instance, as, as caregivers, as patients, as, and, and as students. Uh, so this is also part of his work. Uh, Professor Xiang tries to promote a type of migration studies that is less fixated on migration as a behavior 
and migrants as the subject. His general research approach is to integrate uh, migration research and ethnographic research into institutional and uh, especially political economy analysis. Um, during uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, Shang Biao has uh, taken uh, the initiative to create a coronavirus and mobility forum. And this online forum um, uh, available at uh, the COMPASS uh, website um, facilitates discussion among researchers from multiple disciplines across the world to deepen um, our understanding of the wider impact of the corona crisis. Uh, it also explores new tools in migration research that might help us to make sense of this fast moving world we all live in. And I highly recommend that you visit this online forum, uh, perhaps even take part in, in writing on it, uh, because it's really become a lively discussion platform for, for critical migration researchers from all over the world. Today, uh, Biao Xiang will focus on one of the themes uh, uh, from, from this forum on, on shock mobility. Existing research on shock mobility has primarily focused on the causes, climate migration, distress migration, and so forth, or the solutions, um, for instance, refugee resettlement, instead of the process of movement itself. But today we will get further. So with these words of introduction, uh, please, uh, uh, Professor Biao Xiang, uh, uh, take the, not the floor, uh, but the screen. Thank you very much, Nina. That is a really great pleasure to be here, even though I can't see all the participants, but I can see Nina very well with a very beautiful background. And I just learned actually it's not the real now, but it is, a, it, it, it is a real at a certain moment of time, but not necessarily now. Um, so that's great that Nina gave this I mean, it's very great because it's such a generous introduction, but it is very relevant actually to what I want to say. Uh, basically, the message that I want uh, uh, you to take home, and of course, I want to hear your feedback about, is that shop, shock mobility is not a type of mobility or type of migration. Shock mobility is what I call a link or a moment in mobility assemblage. And actually, shock mobility is a link that will facilitate mutation of mobility. It will be changing one type of mobility into another. But the shock mobility itself should not be fixated as a type of mobility. But of course, in order to understand the meaning of shock mobility, we do need to uh, investigate very carefully what the people actually do. We have to open up the black box of uh, shock mobility. So first of all, a couple of words about definition. I mean, that is in a way self-evident, I hope. Shock mobility is human movements that people take up in response to shocks, to a major disruption in their everyday life. So. I mean, there's a four characteristics I can think of quite descriptively. Number one, it is sudden, unprepared. And uh, uh, number two, the motivation is to get out from a particular place uh, without clearly identified uh, where the destination will be or how they will get into a particular destination. So therefore that leads to a situation that shock mobilities often uh, became a um, limbo mobility. People are stranded halfway. Huh? So we saw quite a few cases like a Chinese students or many other Asian students uh, as well. You know, they desperately want to go, go back to Asia from Europe and the US and they, uh, yeah, it's quite common. They buy five, six, seven tickets, because tickets are being canceled every day, and many of them have to go through three or four countries before they can reach 
their home country. And then they were they find out that actually they landed in the airport that was not <laughs> written in the ticket because all the airplanes are diverted to different airports for the quarantine purposes. So therefore the journey become very complicated. It is really an exit, exit oriented mobility. I mean, this is, a, I want to hear Nina's comments as well because I suppose many refugee migration are like that. So that is a, a, a one of the characteristics and uh, another uh, characteristics is um, the final one is that shock mobilities are short lived because the event itself is so sudden. And once, I mean, then therefore they may not last for too long, even for pandemic, we know it will go away. So the situation may change. I want to emphasize the short livedness because I want to distinguish shock mobilities from like a distress migration, from forced migration, or from so-called reactive migration. Uh, this concept have been talked about already. I mean, like a forced migration refugees, distress or climate uh, refugees, and the reactive migration, or even some people call the acute refugee movements. They are triggered by sudden uh, disruption. But the very soon the situation become perpetual crisis. So they will just become, you know, constantly on the move and then they become refugees. They have to uh, find a settlement, have to find a settlement in the, for the long period of time. But shock mobility that the what we witness now probably is different from this refugee migration. And this is a specificity of what I wanted to look at this uh, short Livedness. Then short livedness, you will say, okay, then that means it's not so uh, significant. True, if you just from policy makers' point of view, probably just we can wait and then let the thing go. But I think from researchers' point of view, these short lived shock mobilities are very interesting, precisely because what it reveals is not so obvious at the first glance. Yet, it can be very important in telling us what's going on in the larger society. Here, I want to draw uh, thoughts from, uh, I can't know, probably three authors. One is uh, Naomi Klein, Shock Doctrine, right? And her idea is a, a bit of a dramatic. Basically, she wants to say shocks are so important now for capitalism because it is a slew all kind of shocks that the new liberal economy policies are implemented. Um, my personal view actually is quite true, even though many shocks probably are not artificially engineered like a war, Iraq, Iraq war or even 1989 Tiananmen in China. But if you look at what happened afterwards, it is true. Uh, immediately after shock, lots of new liberal policies which would have been resisted now were put in place with a relatively less protest and the resistance from the side because the people were so shocked during that uh, special moment. And then we have a second uh, 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 author that I found is very interesting. I mean, of course, it's known to everyone is uh, with back the risk society, right? So then in today's society, risk became more and more uh, prevalent. So therefore we will experience more and more shocks. I mean, not necessarily all the shocks will become wars or we will have a social breakdown, but from the time to time, we will have this kind of shock. So what does this tell us? And the third uh, conceptual idea that inspires me at this moment uh, is uh, William Sewell, a historian's idea called the eventful capitalism or capitalism as eventful history. Uh, because he says, you know, you, you can predict capitalism will live for quite a while, capitalism will expand. But how exactly capitalism does that is very difficult to tell, impossible to tell. And there's a lots of sudden events coming. What make his idea interesting is not just to say, okay, you know, history is full of events, so lots of up and downs. He said capitalism is super eventful because very often it is through these events, dramatic events, capitalism sustains itself. 
So this kind of is similar to what uh, Naomi Klein says. You need the lots of shocks in order to protect the stability of capitalist core, capitalist principle. Other than, otherwise, there will be social resistance, right? So shock became the biggest weapon for social resistance and the social protection. So therefore, this kind of shock that we can say, you know, compared to war and the large scale displacement uh, that I have been paid attention to in refugee studies, this type of shock probably is slightly more mundane. It's not that kind of humanitarianly uh, uh, charging uh, the pandemic. We think, okay, it's probably the same for everyone. It's unfortunate, but probably not that morally outrageous. This kind of uh, uh, shocks, of course, there are many shocks of smaller scale, I think is something we need to think uh, more carefully. And during these shocks, of course, people will make all kinds of uh, uh, decisions about the mobility. So this is my take on, on shock mobility. And then it leads to a very important methodological question, is how do we examine and analyze events like shocks and like shock mobilities that are associated with shocks in order to analyze larger trends or structural changes in society? That is something I think all of us need to face now when we were thinking and living through the pandemic. There's so many things that are so dramatic, so many things are unthinkable, so therefore very stimulating because we thought, oh my God, we never thought of that could happen. But then the question for researcher is, how can we turn that dramatic events into, an, 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 into analytical questions that can well, bring out some lasting, uh, 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 analysis or raise some questions about the bigger structure and institutions, right? So this is, uh, I hope, shock the discussion of shock mobilities will make such a methodological contribution about event analysis or shock analysis. Uh, so how do we do that? Go back to what I said earlier is that uh, probably we should not treat shock mobility as a type of mobility, but we should treat shock mobility as uh, one part of mobility assemblage, but a critical part. I'll give you one example. A typical uh, uh, scenario of shock mobility is what we witnessed from uh, the, 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 the late March from the 25th, actually started slightly earlier, 22nd of March already in India. Until today, hmm? I mean, you, we know, uh, uh, tens of millions, uh, oh no, sorry, millions and possibly tens of millions. I mean, the figure is very difficult to estimate. Migrant workers in India, different parts of India, uh, try to go home from cities because of a lack of public transport. Many of them have to walk mm, for days. And uh, by the end of March, 22 workers, 22 migrants died on the road due to exhaustion, due to hunger, and due to uh, traffic uh, accidents. I mean, that is dramatic. It is a shock of mobility. We ask, okay, how should they understand that this is a shock of mobility? Number one, actually mobility is nothing new to them. Migrants, they are mobile bodies. And we know the typical profile of migrant workers who actually take the long march home, I see a circular migrant from uh, states, from the countryside that is not too far away from the uh, from city. I mean, the geography of migration in India is complex. Basically, if the poorer you are, and the more likely that you will embark circular migration across the state boundaries. Hmm? And if you are richer, probably you will actually you tend to make a shorter distance migration and then will lead to settlement in the, in the city. Uh, so they are circular migration. I mean, they probably work a few months in the city and a few months in the countryside. And in the city, they live on what I call the mobile livelihoods, meaning that their livelihood, their work really rely on mobility, you know, as rubbish collectors 
as cleaners at the household. You know, you have to go to this household at 10 o'clock in the morning and 2 o'clock in the other. So you have to constantly on the move. Of course, you have street peddlers and then you have coolies who carry heavy things for, for uh, other people and the construction workers also have to move from site to site. And then in the cities, they are also highly mobile. But now suddenly you have lockdown, 24th, Indian government announced that there will be lockdown nationwide from the 25th. So the old business are closed. So their internal city mobility is blocked. And then public transport is suspended. So their seasonal mobility was also disrupted. And then uh, they, they are typically in day wages. They call the day wage earners. I mean, if they don't work for a day, the tomorrow morning, there'll be no money to pay rent in the Shanti town, no money to buy food. I mean, this is why they have to leave, right? Uh, and so therefore, their long march home is not because they want to leave hmm, per se, but it's because, precisely because their previous established mobility pattern was disrupted. And the reason why their pet, earlier pattern mobility was disrupted because the government and the middle class citizens said, we have to stop. We have to freeze the, the country. For the poor, actually, they don't mind too much because the livelihood and the wage are almost always come before health. We know that, right? So therefore, so their shock mobility is, cannot be understood as mobility itself. It is, has to be understood in relation to their own other pattern of mobility as well as other people's decisions about the mobility and immobility. So this is what I mean. Shock mobility actually is a link in a mobility assemblage. A mobility assemblage means the collections of different type of mobility of a particular actor, as well as mobility of different actors that are interrelated to each other. And of course, we know once these people reach home, in older days, or once you return from cities, your fellow villagers will come to, you know, the head of the end of a village where the bus stops to welcome you, give you flowers, etc. But this time, of course, not. You know, people say, why do you come home now? I mean, you have to be quarantined and that. So there's new social tensions arising in the village as well. So you see here, the meaning of return also changed. The relation between the returning migrants and their fellow villagers also, also changed. So that is a trigger, lots of new social relations, social changes. So this is how I understood, how I understand uh, 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 shock mobilities as a link. And uh, uh, so therefore it's a moment, it's a short lived, yeah, but I think the short-livedness is, is the beauty of the story. It is a very acute moment, and you can see how things are thrown into uh, instability, un instability. So, I mean, probably I just give you, a, I know that we are running out of time, but I just give you a few kind of empirical uh, cuts of, uh, of what the shock mobilities look like in reality. I, I mean, this is not a typology, but uh, let's say the manifestations manifestations of shock mobilities as links of mobility assemblage. Basically, there's two types. One is that you can say it's the primary shock mobility, meaning that the people react to a crisis or perceive the danger immediately. And in the second one is a secondary uh, shock mobilities. It's not a response to the immediate danger, but it's a response to other people's decisions about mobility or immobility. So number one, it can be divided into two types. It's kind of, you can say, reaction mobility, or reactive mobility, or reactive immobility, right? So reactive mobility is, we know thousands of people in early March try to leave Milan back to South Italy uh, or just away from Milan and that create a huge uh, controversy in Italy. And then you have about 300,000 people who left the Wuhan, the first city in the world being locked down, uh, uh, which is in China, within the first hours of, uh, uh, after the, the lockdown was announced. Uh, so, and then you have 
the international students who, I mean, also experience, I think it's a quite a typical shock mobility because it's, uh, it's driven by the sense of security existential worry. Huh? And then they often take quite a desperate actions. Uh, so all this mobility actually needed to be examined very carefully because they may have very important policy consequences, as we know, you know, because you want to lock down, but people want to uh, flee. But on, on the other hand, it's completely rational at the individual level. So this is uh, number one primary shock mobility. Number two primary shock mobility is actually reactive immobility. Mm. So here is important because, as I said, analytically, we want to look at the shock mobility as a link of mobility assemblage, looking at its function of mutating mobilities. So therefore, immobility itself is very important. Immobility is not just a, a stay still. For many people, immobility means a very dramatic action, means a very painful decisions the people who uh, own uh, mobile livelihoods, for example, they, they, they decide not to, to move around. This is a huge uh, thing. And then you have lots of migrant workers who have signed the contract, Nina will know this very well, paid all the fees to the agents, and now suddenly they are told, they are already went to the you know, capital city in Manila, and etc., waiting for next flight to go out, but now they're told, sorry, all the contracts are canceled, no flight, you have to go home village. Uh, so that, 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 uh, that a type of, of immobility, the cancellation of mobility itself also needed to be paid attention to. So this is uh, the primary shock mobility. And then you have a secondary. So I think it's more important. The secondary, I, div I mean, now I have observed the three types of secondary uh, shock mobility. Number one is survival mobility. Uh, the typical example, again, is this uh, Indian migrant workers. As I said, they are not direct reaction, that might be not a direct action to the coronavirus itself, okay? Nor is it a direct reaction to the lockdown, but it is a reaction to the, the social reality, which is created by all the class relations and their earlier job and livelihood patterns, survival. They, they, they have to go in order to survive in the current condition. Number two, secondary is limbo mobility. Uh, and then typical example are seafarers. Now we know there are about 150,000 seafarers whose contracts are due already, but they're still on the ocean. They're floating. There are no, 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 nowhere, no harbor agree to allow their uh, ship to, to park and therefore to, um, uh, to disembark. Uh, of course, all the passengers, the tourists in the cruises or, or stranded uh, uh, elsewhere, they are limbo uh, mobility. The third part I think is most interesting to me is I call the substitution mobility. Once some people decide not to move, and what does this mean? It means that you need to outsource your mobility to someone else. Once the government tell you not to move, it means the government have to arrange someone else to do the mobility for you, to deliver food or the essential medicines to your doorstep. And this is why actually in a way Chinese uh, government did well because they can mobilize all their civil servants to become delivery workers you know, during these two months, especially in Wuhan. You know, they will collect the information, okay, what kind of ship do you want, a fish do you want today? So they will get the fish for you. <laughs> this is how civil servants used to be sitting in the office, don't want to talk to you. But now they're under the pressure, they work as delivery workers. Uh, the substitution ability is in turn uh, carried out in two ways, administratively, uh, you know, organized by government. And of course, more commonly, it is done commercially through platform economy, through apps. You will know Amazon and Alibaba, eBay, I mean, these companies are getting bigger every day right? because we rely on them for the commercialized, outsourced, specialized 
uh, um, but that is substitution. Again, it's go back to the assemblage and the distributive qualities of mobility. You know, some people don't move, it means someone else will have to move more. And the question is how that is organized. So finally, uh, the point is, uh, Nina also mentioned the, the idea of a migration infrastructure. I have been thinking, I mean, this is, I really want to hear Nina's uh, feedback as well as suggestions, the comments from the audience. Did you see whether or not the shock mobilities may induce certain changes in uh, mobility or migration infrastructure, and uh, therefore it uh, may change our uh, patterns of mobility in the long run. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do see uh, some um, uh, evidence. Uh, one is, the most obvious one actually is the increase uh, of uh, uh, platform economy that facilitate uh, delivery business. So the, uh, and that of course is associated with the casualization of, of labor and, uh, and the gig economy. And that is a very important infrastructural development, meaning that once a company invests so much to develop this system, they are not going to give up easily. They want that to expand even further. Uh, and then, of course, surveillance technology uh, is developing. And in, I mean, based on observation in China, there's a, even increasing popular demand for surveillance during shock mobility because people say, oh my God, you know, this, uh, why these people allowed to leave Wuhan? Huh? Where are they? Who are they? I mean, there was a lot of popular demand for government to, to explain uh, who's the, where these people are. And actually government could not. I mean, we think the Chinese government knows everything, but it, actually it's not this time. Uh, I think only one province can identify how many people left uh, the lockdown city and entered that province. Other provinces cannot do that. So therefore there's a demand to see, you know, it should be more centralized surveillance system. This is another very important infrastructural development. And the third uh, uh, observation, it's very tentative, very early, but it's telling, and also it's very surprising, is that in China, the demand for private car is increasing. And the reason is that because public transport is just too dangerous. You know, if next time another, we need to embark on a shock mobility to run away or do something, we better to have our own car, rely on other people, the vehicle is not reliable. And also there is a discussion, we don't see data yet, that probably the property price at least will not drop, even though it is meant to drop before the pandemic. But now with the slowing down economy, actually property price will stay strong. Why is that? The one possible reason for that is that because demand is increasing. People think they need to have their own property, you know, being a tenant is not a very uh, secure. Mm -hmm. So therefore you have this further privatization of life, and then you have enhanced securitization of mobility and of citizens imposed by government. And then you have deeper commercialization or casualization as carried out by companies. And this could be a possible uh, outcome from uh, this, uh, this shock of mobilities uh, in the context of pandemic. But that is, I think, yeah, I want to hear your observation, but the most important point today is, I, 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 I feel I'm sitting in exam, just a report, the very tentative idea of this concept and the see whether or not it makes sense and how I, we should move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for this extremely uh, inter interesting and uh, sophisticated, I will say, uh, analysis of shock mobility and the variation in it uh, and all these mobility assemblages. And I really like that you sort of underscore that we are not looking at a particular form of migration, but we are looking at these uh, grid reactions. Mm -hmm. So one of the grid uh, reactions that I myself find shocking, 
So my shock on other people's reaction to mobility is how fast and how easy the world was able to, um, to close borders mm. as a means to protect ourselves from um, the dangers brought about by others' mobilities and very much um, migrants. And it took a while before, I mean, even though the, the World Health Organization, everybody said, you know, this is actually maybe not very helpful and or who is it helpful for? Uh, most people reacted with, of course, that's what we do. We restrict mobility without really knowing because, I mean, analysis shows that it's business travelers, it's tourists, who have been the main um, movers of, of the virus, not migrants, because migrants stay relatively put in the areas where they work. Um, some refugees, of course, uh, move uh, in order to, 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 to find a secure environments. But, but coronavirus did not enter through these means. We, have, we do not have much uh, evidence of that. So that was sort of shocking in a way to me uh, how humanitarian principles uh, were able to sort of be sidestepped in a way to save the world or particular parts of the world from uh, becoming uh, infected uh, by, um, uh, by a virus. Uh, and I think that's nothing new. There's nothing new in blaming whatever, um, uh, and especially um, disease uh, and, and virus and, and, and contamination uh, on, on migrants. But still, I think uh, it, it perhaps took a particular form. Or would you say that what we have seen uh, recently is just a continuation of the same discourse that, I mean, go way back to the first migrations perhaps and, and, and uh, the receiving uh, communities, societies, states to sort of step back from that. Do you see some new reactions here? Mm. Okay, thank you. So that's, that's a wonderful uh, point actually, Anina. I don't know how much I can address your question, but the, 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 your comments really, your surprise is a very inspiring surprise and an important one. First of all, I, empirically, I would probably need to uh, do more work to find out whether or not there is a tendency that the people blame migrants. I feel probably it's not very obvious for me. The obvious, the knee-jerk reaction is just to close down everything, stop all kind of mobilities. You know, it's a high class or low class. We don't want any any uh, any any uh, body. So this kind of suspension of mobility, suspension of contact, in general, that is true. It is surprising to me, and then it makes me think. Make, makes me think. You know, all this middle class, the mainstream, or if we look at the West Europe. Uh, society, I mean, despite the rise of right wing and etc., the majority of middle class are su still supposed to be very uh, cosmopolitan and globally oriented. And how could the people uh, like that so easily uh, go back to that kind of mentality, thinking that uh, the safest thing to do is to close borders, even though there's no evidence? So that I think is interesting because that's probably uh, what tell us what the what is the earlier cosmopolitanism uh, ideology is really based on. Uh, as we said earlier, the true I mean I can, I think there is a, probably four types of reaction about uh, to 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 this uh, pandemic. The very rich one, they are very mobile because they have a second home in a coast or in the hill, either within the same country or different countries. We do see the wealthy ones, they will run away from cities to countryside. So they are reaction mobility, mobile. And there's a very bottom one, 
I don't know much about Europe, but in Asia and in China, for them, for the very bottom and the true countryside, their strategy is self-protection. They erect all wars against their villages. This is completely rational because there's no good medical facilities there. If they catch a virus, of course, I mean, they just don't know whether or not the only solution is die. So therefore, all they can do is to protect themselves physically. So that's too bad. And then middle too, the middle class is arguing for quarantine, stay home, stay home and be responsible and close the borders. And then you have this actually, the productive, most I mean, working class, many of them are migrants. They are doing the real job or kind of physical job. I mean, the, the, the typical representative will be the key workers or essential workers nowadays. These are people rely on mobility, hmm? rely on mobility. So therefore their understanding of border connectivity and the cosmopolitanism among this working class, effective working class, people may be very different from uh, the cosmopolitanism as expressed by the middle class. And this time, uh, go back to your uh, question, what does this tell us? I think it tells us this type of uh, uh, a quite elitist middle class dematerialized cosmopolitanism actually is a mainstay, is a mainstay. And, as, uh, and so we still need to work harder to cultivate uh, this working class, okay, the, the, the notion of uh, international relations with a very concrete material basis, material basis because their livelihood relies on that, right? And then also, of course, we have to consider the disenfranchised, the, the rural poor. It seems they are, they, 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 they can become very uh, uh, parochial and very uh, isolated. So how, how to figure that out probably is, is uh, uh, a key question. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Biao. Uh, I will attend to some of the questions uh, posed by our audience, even though I have uh, several more uh, myself, but let's see if we have uh, time for that. Because um, we have uh, a, a question from Simon Turner, who asks uh, really uh, how much um, these thoughts on, on, on shock mobility related very much to labor migration uh, um, is applicable uh, to war and 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 um, conflict situations. He writes. Uh, Usually, we explore forced displacement, and Stephen Lubkeman made us aware of those who are stuck in place during conflict, displaced in place. But we know from World War II that many people got stuck, not at home, but. Uh, far away from home and their circulation was stopped and they got stuck in another continent. So Simon Turner says, I guess my question is, can we use your ideas in relation to violent conflict? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but I think uh, the, the direction of learning should be opposite because so much work have been done already on uh, war and the conflict related uh, forced migration and the strandedness and the limbo situation, right? So we need to learn from them actually in order to develop the notion of shock mobilities. And the shock mobility uh, wanted to contribute to an understanding that in a peace time and quite a peaceful, even quite very prosperous situation, Europe or China, I mean, that's still far away from anything, uh, will resemble the situation of war and displacement. How this type of shock, uh, quite a mundane shock, uh, create uh, social changes. Yeah. So, so, but whether or not we can, or then in turn contribute to, to uh, refugees and violence studies, I, I, I don't know yet. I don't know yet. Thank you, Biao. Uh, I have uh, two questions uh, from uh, Abdi Fatah Ahmed. Uh, one is um, whether and which uh, qualitative data collection methods uh, that can be used to research shock mobility and what uh, the limitations could be to that. 
Um, and the other, which is different, uh, is uh, how would you say that shock mobility will change af or affect the relationship between state and citizens? So one is sort of a concrete yeah. methodological question and the other a much more uh, ideological question, I would say. Yes, <laughs> you put it very nicely, Nina. So let's go for the ideological one first. Uh, so. I mean, it will change. I think actually it's a very good point. Uh, state citizen relations may be one of the arena where shock and mobility uh, change a great deal. Mm, it's a, one of the controversies that we see in India is that the Indian government decided to airlift a, I don't know how many, probably hundreds of uh, Indians overseas at the cost of the state budget to return to India while you have millions and 10 millions uh, internal migrants walking home uh, in this, uh, I mean, Indian April is very hot already. Uh, so so in, the, in the former case, you know, we do see many countries symbolically as well as physically, they uh, put a lot of emphasis on this repatriation or evacuation uh, program. Uh, operation to bring their citizens home. I mean, I to be honest, that because I know very little about international law, and I, I don't quite understand why uh, they want to do that. Apart from symbolic value, right? Like Britain was a such a, is is its own knee in in fighting pandemic. Yet they make a big deal. We are bring all the people back from the mountain in Nepal back to London. I mean. <laughs> Why, why should the people at this moment rush back from Nepal in the clearest air in, in Himalaya back to, 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 to downtown London? Well, anyway, they are doing that and the people are, are following that. Uh, so that that's definitely have some relation changes in terms of how state imagines the citizens and how the citizens imagine their relation to the state. And then internal migration, I think, will have less symbolic but the more substantive uh, dimension to the how the relation may be may be changed. I mean, again, if you look at the China, you know, so many emotional, deeply emotional debates going on. Yeah. It's all related to that. So that is, I mean, I can't summarize, but all the only the, the thing I want. So that go back to the idea of you know mobility assemblage. So we have to look at the mobility just not as a, hum as a behavior, you know, it's, it's, we have to move away from this behavioral uh, study of migration. The migration is always a, a complex, the, 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 the lots of relations come together create a migration, right? So we have to unpack migration that way. So state citizen relation is a key of them in the modern society. So the methodological question, it's a, a wonderful question. We have to explore. As I said, one of the contributions that we want to make is precisely that. How can we start a sudden event without being trapped by its dramatic feature? Uh, I think ethnographic uh, interview would be an important uh, uh, practical technique but the more importantly is how we can establish or trace the relation between one piece of actions, what the people do to other. Hmm? Of course, sometimes it is conscious to the actors after asking the question the actor can tell us, but very often it's not of that direct. Hmm? I mean, that is what I learned from my earlier study with SARS 2003. Now, I worked on migrant workers in China during SARS. Then you can see actually the migrant workers, they did flee cities, but they, they fled the cities not because they are worried about virus, but simply because the middle class worry about virus. So they cut close down the restaurants and the migrant workers have no place to sleep and to go home. So how do you create that kind of chain reactions? Uh, that will be a challenge. And we are doing that. We now try to create a, I call it a, a more lab, mobility, uh, what, more lab, mobility lab, but the full name is a uh, 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 mobility uh, health, something else, <laughs> three words, now I can't remember. We wanted to create an inventory in different, I mean, 
then collect all this qualitative information in different countries and uh, try to, number one, uh, uh, establish the basic phenomenon, you know, what the new type of mobility is emerged, what the people actually do. And the number two is to establish relations between uh, the different types of mobilities and the relation to policies, to class relations, to urban rural relations, to labor uh, employment patterns. Yeah. So we 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 don't know yet. Yeah. I, I would be very very grateful if yeah the audience can give suggestion and or you can join our. Mm -hmm. Uh, a project in one way or another to explore together. Yeah. Well, I think one of the very wonderful things about uh, your, your mobility forum um, is that it has this global coverage. I mean, you know that my, uh, most of my work is in, in, in Latin America and uh, I can find uh, pieces from Latin America, but I can also compare them to pieces from Asia or Africa on, 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 on your web, which is uh, very interesting. And one of the things that have uh, sort of stricken me most is how maybe perhaps especially politicians get so surprised by new directions of mobilities and in particular return mobility, mm -hmm. uh, which there's nothing new about people going back if they cannot um, uh, sustain a living where yeah. they are return migration was always there but it's like people are shocked that one third of Peru's urban migrants uh, try to get back to the countryside in the wake of the corona crisis and of course there's particular health issues uh, related to large amounts of people moving towards uh, rural centers with very poor, uh, poor uh, health care. Yeah. Uh, uh, 50,000 Venezuelans have returned from Colombia and, and uh, Brazil during yeah. the Corona crisis, for instance, which is, but weren't they refugees? Yeah, but even refugees need to be able to survive, right? Mm -hmm. And where will you think that you have, have, have better chances? So, 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 so those kind of questions are, are really interesting to follow, I think. Yeah. I have some more questions here. Uh, from from the audience, I have one uh, from from uh, Nick Van Heer, which is perhaps also a comment on on a discussion that we already had, uh, yeah. because he said, following up from Nina's comment, isn't it curious that it's the left or progressives that have been calling for lockdown immobility, or immobility, and the right that is calling for opening up uh, and resumption of mobility at least. That's the story in in uh, the UK. He says so. You already uh, responded uh, somewhat to that, I think. Uh, I have um, uh, Ida Marie Wamen, uh, who, apart from from thanking you for a, a wonderful seminar, uh, uh, asked if we could also talk about uh, shock immobility. Mm. Uh, and she asks, uh, could the death of George Floyd or migrants en route, uh, refugees uh, in, in transit, uh, be seen as such, which mm. I think is very to the point of, of uh, your ideas of assemblages. Yeah, yeah, no, no, definitely. Yeah, so hello, uh, Nick. Yes, actually, what I presented earlier is a very primit uh, it was very primitive, but it benefited greatly from a conversation with uh, Nick. Uh, a couple of days ago. Yeah, so yeah, so the left, uh, uh, the immobile left and the mobile right, it is uh, 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 curious, but I think it's quite clear, right? It's a, it's a, yeah, it is a very sharp observation. And my understanding is that the left think it is a public uh, benefit, you know, the government has to take a responsibility. And so therefore, and being immobile is being responsible and being mobile is uh, you are seeking profit. It's a, it's a selfish. You want the convenience, you want the business as a usual. Um, so that's uh, again. I mean that is is of course is based on a very particular understanding of a public responsibility. Uh, I'm still wondering whether or not 
uh, it is a case as I mentioned earlier. So the left, the urban middle class understanding of mobility and openness actually is dematerialized when they were talking about you know, openness and mobility. It does not really touch on the livelihood level. It is more just a, as a matter of principle. And once the situation becomes so concrete, and then they, of course, they back, uh, back off. Um, so the, the, the shock immobility, I, I definitely, definitely. And then you have all these refugee uh, issues in Europe. I mean, they, are, they really suffer from uh, shock immobility. And, uh, uh, but, but, I, but there is little technical problem in my thinking how to bring in uh, shock immobility in a, some neater way to make mm -hmm. the framework clearer. You know, otherwise, people think, OK, then you're talking about everything. The shock is it's, <laughs> it's everything. So, so the immobility actually is, is just another type of uh, mobility. Because once the refugee cannot uh, claim uh, uh, you know, lodge the application, once all this uh, assistance and uh, processing uh, were stopped, does not mean these people are completely stay there and not moving. I mean, they may have embarked on lots of a short distance and a frequent uh, mobility. Like one example is the truck drivers in China. Of course, the truck drivers earn most of the money by through long haul. You know, it's a three days uh, delivery, but now it's all stopped. And what do they do? They became taxi drivers. Yes. And the taxi drivers became food delivery uh, workers. So, so that the taxi and the long distance uh, logistics were stopped, but then you have another type of mobility uh, uh, emerge. So, so the shock immobility is, it, it should also be seen as a link of, of this mobility assemblage. Yeah, but I need a better, find better words for that. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have three more questions uh, um, uh, that the audience has asked. Uh, I will ask uh, uh, our, our technical assistant to close for more questions because we don't uh, have time for that. Uh, I will give you the three questions, um, um, uh, Biao, um, and ask you to be brief uh, so that we will have just a few minutes to wrap up before we have to end. So uh, Naya Kleist asks, if you could elaborate on the role on migration infrastructure in facilitating shock mobility, will some of the usual uh, infrastructure uh, being disrupted or cancelled? Mm -hmm. That's a huge question for a short answer, I know. Shall we, shall we uh, hear all the three questions together? Then probably it's easier okay. to make yes. uh, So uh, uh, this is on, on the infrastructure. Uh, yes, Bob Janssen, uh, he's uh, particularly interested in the notion of reactive mobility. Uh, but he asked, is there a risk of depoliticizing uh, the way mobilities are spurred by mediated misinformation and or government policies at genders that may be far removed from the immediate response to, say, a, a pandemic? Um, and uh, he, he uh, adds, I think, Nina's reflections on the closing of state borders in Europe show that although that strategy was uh, presented as a direct response to the spread of COVID-19, it may have been motivated by migration governance uh, priorities that have more to do with how immigration has been politicized in Europe in recent years than a p pandemic uh, response. Uh, I definitely agree with that myself. <laughs> and then Carlos Abuanza, uh, one of my colleagues uh, from far away, asks, um, I would imagine that there are several moments in shock mobilities. Have you encountered empirical evidence where there are different ways of shock and response? I mean, is it possible that for some, shock mobility can become a more stable displacement over time and space. Uh, another very good question to think with. So now, uh, brief responses to 
three <laughs> very large questions. Which is uh, nearly impossible. Let me try. So I started with the last question. Of course, I mean, uh, shock and mobility are as a moment uh, of mobility, as a link of mobility, as amplage, it is open-ended, you know, in terms of how it will turn out to be. Uh, in reality, of course, a large number of migrants, I mean, refugees, are actually a kind of uh, uh, people who are locked into shock mobility for a long period of time, definitely. So it has a, the danger that for many, shock mobility becomes a norm. Uh, again, but analytically, I think uh, the contribution we want to make is that we want to stay with the short-lived-ness nature. Uh, so therefore, we can distinguish the, this uh, research from conventional refugee uh, uh, studies. Uh, second question, I, I, I see the point about um, uh, you know, the closure of a border is actually motivated at least to some degree by the concern of the migrants. But I didn't get to the question how that is related to the, uh, the, the concept of uh, reactive mobility. Now, probably what uh, the question meant is that what appear to be reactive mobility actually is not really reactive to the apparent Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a stimuli or the event. Uh, they are reacting to something else, which is a hidden. So they are not really reacting to virus, but they are reacting to their own fear. Or well, one could say uh, using yeah. the corona uh, uh, or uh, COVID-19 pandemic for migration control purposes. Yeah, so that- that's In the pipeline anyway. Yeah, so that is a very, uh, uh, very uh, likely uh, so therefore, this way, when we examine reactive mobilities, we have to uh, make sure, you know, the embedded feature, you know, this reactive mobility is always taken by particular people who are positioned in society, uh, which is shaped by all these uh, ideologies and uh, and uh, it's always gender last. Yeah. So, well, but that I, I think empirically we. Maybe I would be slightly cautious, not because I disagree with this hypothesis, but I just think if we're more cautious, we'll open up more space for nuances. Because in reality, maybe uh, like, a, you know, like Trump, if you look at it in the US, the anti-migration discourse rhetoric was so strong before the pandemic, but actually, you know, after, during the pandemic, you can see, uh, the, it's a, the, the condition for illegal migrants become relatively uh, tolerant uh, simply because of necessity. They need uh, the body to, you know, to pick up a vegetable and uh, to do cleaning and etc. So this is, uh, the relation is uh, probably quite complex here. Yeah. So um, and though that is a very interesting. Reactive is never a kind of a, one on one, point to point, a direct uh, link a reaction, right? The reaction itself is always a multifacetated. Yeah, so that's a great point. So the last of, uh, question, which was uh, uh, raised the earliest, uh, uh, migration uh, infra infrastructure, mobility infrastructure, definitely, definitely. Uh, the highway, uh, the existence of highway was uh, e essential for how uh, shock mobilities play out in both China and uh, India. And mo lots of Indian workers are there walk along highways. This is why the, 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 it's so dangerous. The traffic accidents were the high. You know, people uh, uh, were killed. And then you have shock um, airlines. Uh, the price is uh, now, I mean, the Chinese students have to pay 10 times more as usual uh, to go back to China if they're lucky to get a ticket. And one of the reasons is that all the airplanes, uh, they reduce the number of passengers by two thirds in order for uh, allow for social distancing. And then this, this is a physical reshaping of infrastructure immediately, of course, we know, have direct consequences for social stratification, right? Who will get into now everyone have to fly in business class. This is business class become default. Right? Uh, so that's, but, but so far I can't really 
it is still very early stage. I, I, I'm, I'm far away from, uh, you know, coming up with any formula uh, about that. Well, one of the, the issues I have seen in, in the Americas and also been called by European press uh, to comment upon is sort of the reversal of human smuggling. Mm. Uh, that human smugglers have recently smuggled Moroccans back from Spain to Morocco as a reaction of the Moroccan state closing their borders, that we have seen the fences between Ceuta and, and Melilla and uh, being being sort of crawled from the other direction, from the Spanish side, for people uh, needing to get back because they lost their livelihoods. Um, um, I've, I've also seen um, um, other ways of, of, of people sort of, or that industry or infrastructure very quickly reshaping uh, um, the direction uh, of, of, of migration. So, I mean, these assemblages can, can probably go in in any direction, um, yeah. um, and and very quickly um, accommodate to the clients' needs um, uh, here. Yeah, no, yeah. and uh, the, the the way how air tickets are being sold now, it's all you have intermediaries there, right? Yeah. And all the smugglers in between Venezuela and the Colombia. There's yeah, the exactly. The yeah. yeah. Had this been a physical seminar, we would um, say we are about to end and people would sit waiting excited on their chairs to be able to uh, walk up to the podium and have a little chat with you uh, afterwards. And uh, some of us would probably have had a drink um, or a coffee or maybe even some snacks and dinners afterward where we could have maintained this enormously interesting uh, discussion. You and I have agreed to try to maintain the discussion and perhaps write a little piece mm -hmm. uh, based on this. Hopefully we'll, we'll be able to, mm -hmm. um, because it's really a shame uh, that we have uh, to end uh, in the midst of a very, very interesting discussion. But uh, I want to thank you very, very much for agreeing uh, to, to meet up uh, uh, in, in, in this way, I want to uh, thank uh, all the attendees, uh, those who have listened, uh, those who have commented. Uh, it's, it's been a, a truly uh, inspiring conversation. We've had also, even though it was to be through uh, the means of, of writing um, uh, questions uh, online. Uh, so thank you everyone uh, for this. Um, these will have more uh, migration seminars. Some of them will be webinars, so stay tuned to our webpage. And we have several webinars on other themes and migration coming up. You can see them uh, also on our webpage or sign up uh, to our newsletters and, and get notifications. So thank you very much, all of you, and especially you, uh, Professor Yao Shang. It's been really great uh, to, to have you with us. And also your colleagues behind the scene, behind the screens, who have been making definitely the infrastructure. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye, bye.